Hey everyone, it's Robert Hall and this is an operational guide on the Godox X2T transmitter for Godox X-Series strobes. Now I've tried to deliver a camera angle that allows you to see the controls on the back display as well as access to the top here because there are controls on the top and the back of this device. But for general reference of the video, I'll refer to these buttons up here as the group buttons and these buttons here I'll refer to by their name on the back. And it also may be tough to see from here, but this is the primary control dial right here on the bottom left side. So this is where we'll be making most of our adjustments. To start off, we wanna make sure that you have the proper transmitter for your camera brand. These are designated by the letter that associates with your brand of camera. So if you have a Sony camera like I do, you would want the R2T Mark II S model. And if you wanted Fuji, you'd need the F model, the Nikon, the N model, and so on. But you wanna make sure that you have the right one because some of these have different style pins and that makes sure that you not only have a good fit to your device, but also that you have the additional pins necessary to communicate such things as TTL and high-speed sync as those are brand specific. Now taking this off on the left side of the device, you have a USB-C port for connecting for firmware, as well as a 3.5 millimeter port. And on the right-hand side, you have two switches the left one is the on off switch for the device and the right one is for the auto focused assist lamp that you will find right here in the front. Now to connect this transmitter to your camera, you wanna slide it all the way forward and then you wanna slide this to the right until it locks and to release it, you just have to press this gray switch in and then you can twist it left and now it's ready to be removed. Now, if you see in the bottom right corner, I just powered this on and I just put a fresh set of batteries in, but I only have two out of three bars. The reason for this is because I'm using rechargeable batteries. If you're using standard batteries, then you'll get a very accurate readout here, but because rechargeable batteries have a slightly lower voltage, they don't accurately report how full they are. So these batteries are full, but I can't really count on this to be exactly accurate and it's going to last a lot longer than what it shows on here. That's just something that you need to be aware of if you're putting rechargeable batteries in here. I've inserted a flash in here that way you can see how we would set up both of these devices. Now one note here, there is some stability issues when you have a flash this close to the transmitter. So if you're trying to set this up at home, just make sure to give yourself more space between the transmitter and the flash that you're trying to trigger. Okay, so in the top right corner here, you can see that this transmitter is in channel 21, but the flash is in channel five. So real quick, I'm going to change the channel of this flash to make sure that it matches the transmitter. This is different on each flash and in the links below, you can find operational guides to every single one of these flashes that are compatible here if you need to get more accustomed to using the flash. But now we're on channel 21 on both of these. And I'm also gonna change this to group A. So right now this flash is off because it is not activated on the transmitter. But as soon as I select group A and then press mode to change to either TTL or manual, we'll use manual for this example. Now the transmitter is connected with the flash and submitting the power level to it. So if we need to change that power level, we can increase or decrease the power level of the flash remotely. We can also change the mode of it if we want to turn it back to off or turn it to TTL, we can do so from here. So now you can see there's no power level here, but it is in TTL. Now that I have the flash in TTL, whenever I take a shot, the flash is going to automatically determine its power output to match best with my settings. Now we can repeat this process adding more lights and having independent control of the power level of each flash by putting them in different groups. So if we added a second light, it could be in group B. If we added a third light, it could be in group C and so on. Now, if we want to test fire the flash, we can always hit the button on the top. There's a test button. It looks like a flash symbol. We hit that, it's going to fire the flash. Now, say we've dialed in our settings completely and we don't want them to get messed up at all. You see this lock icon right here to the right of the mode button? That is the hold function of the mode button. So if we hold this down, now we're locked no matter what we hit. It doesn't matter, we can't change anything and nothing's going to change our settings. And to release that, all we have to do is hold down the mode button again to unlock it. Now below the mode button is the menu button which will go over all the custom functions that this gives you in a moment. But for right now, I wanna point your attention to the modeling lamp icon to the right of that button. The modeling lamp control is the hold function of the menu button. So if I select group A and then hold down the menu button, 
you'll see that the modeling lamp to the flash comes on. Now, obviously this is only gonna work if the flash that you're using has a modeling lamp as some of the speed lights and lights do not have a modeling lamp on them, but this gives you quick control and you can see that the modeling lamp is on for this group. So we can hold down the menu button to turn that back off. Next, I wanna point you, now the set button is just for basic confirmation. We hit set, now we're no longer selected on that A group, but I also wanna point your attention to the all function. The all function is a way that if we had five different lights set up, say with different power levels, we'll actually just do three lights. We'll do A, B, and C, and we'll do each one at a slightly different power level. There we go, we got one 128th, 164th, and 132nd power. Now if I hold down the set button, I am now selecting all of these groups power, so as I increase them, they will all go up or down. Note, once you get to the minimum or maximum power setting of any of the groups that you have selected, you will not be able to decrease or increase it anymore. Meaning if I get to 1 1 28th, I can't turn it down anymore. And as soon as one of these lights hits full power, I can't turn the others up anymore. This is really nice if you've got a good lighting ratio between three lights, but your ambient settings change and all of a sudden you need to change the output of all of your lights to counteract an adjustment that you made in camera. You can't have any groups selected in order for this all function to work. For instance, if I have the A group selected and then I try to select all the lights, nothing's ever gonna happen. But as soon as I set the A group and I'm done with it, and I'm not selecting on any specific group, holding that all function will quickly select all the groups. Now in regards to getting the auto-focused assist lamp to work, this gives a lot of people trouble because they don't understand when autofocus assist is supposed to work. Autofocus assist lamp is going to emit a red beam. If you're in a low light condition, it's supposed to shine light on your subject. That way you can eat more easily grab focus. But what a lot of people don't realize is that autofocus assist only works in single shot AF. But there's one other thing. The autofocus assist lamp is designed to illuminate the center of your frame, which means if your focus point is not in the center of the frame, that you might not trigger it. This varies based on the camera. Lastly, you have an autofocus illuminator setting in your camera. Now the basic function is to be a light that is on your camera body that sends out usually an orange or a white light so that you can more clearly focus. But it also manages the signal for external flashes. So that needs to be on, either on or auto, in order for it to function as well. So now you can clearly see on my hand the autofocus assist grid working. Now a lot of people don't even think this is possible on Sony cameras, but it does work so long as you have all four of those settings activated. You have the AF illuminator on, on the X2T. You have the AF illuminator set to active in the camera. You have your autofocus mode set to AFS and you have your point in the center. Okay, so that covers all of the buttons on the outside of the device. So let's now talk about custom functions, which are in here in the menu. If we press menu, we get a little sub menu that goes over all the custom functions that are available. Okay, page one, we have first the sync option, which lets us choose between standard front curtain sync or high speed sync. Rear curtain sync is a function in the camera. If you wanna change that, that's gonna be available in your camera. But if you're looking for high speed sync, then you're gonna to want to change down to this option. It looks like a little H. That stands for high speed sync. Additionally, you're gonna to have to have this set up in your camera and your camera is gonna to have to be capable of high speed sync as well. Enabling high speed sync on the trigger and on the camera will not only allow you to go past that sync speed, but it will also automatically tell your flash without having to come up and adjust it on your flash. Second option is for Bluetooth. It's where you can turn the Bluetooth of the device on, which if you're not trying to use it, make sure that this function is off as it does take a lot of battery power. I always keep it off, but if you're trying to connect directly to the app on the phone, this is where you do so and the information that you need to connect to the app as well. The third option is the beep. Now this is nothing to do with the beeps on the device, it's the beeps on your flash, the recycle beeps. So you can see this little indicator right here on the flash. If I set this to off, that's gonna disappear. So if you want the beep on, you can control that remotely. 
Next up, we have the zoom function. This will not do anything to this flash, but if you're using this with a speed light, then you can either set the zoom to auto or the specific zoom focal length that you want the flash to be at. Next up, we have the scan function, which is about a 15 second process that once you hit start, the transmitter is now searching for the wireless channel that has the least amount of interference to give you the cleanest channel. That way all of your lighting equipment can go off without any issues. After you've run it, it will give you eight of the best channels in your area that have the least amount of interference. So after running that scan feature, the next function is the channel function. This is where you can change the channel of the device. So if we found out that channel 21 wasn't in that top eight, now we could simply change it to one of the channels that it recommended. Next, we have the ID function. It can either be set to off, which will just ignore the ID function altogether, or we can set it to a specific two digit number between one and 99. So let's say we set it to 10. Right now I'm firing group A, but this flash isn't firing, even though it's in group A. And that's because the ID function is not on this device. The ID function is a simple way to protect your flash from being fired by other people who might be on the same channel as you. The PC sync option has choices of in or out. This controls the port on the side and whether it is sending a fire signal outbound or anticipating receiving a signal. Next up, we have the radio delay. We can set anywhere from 0.1 milliseconds all the way to 9.9 .9 milliseconds. So really tight timings here that you can use for hypersync settings, but make sure that's off if you're not trying to use hypersync. The shoot function has three options. You can see there's a single head, multiple heads, or an app. The single head is designed for a single photographer working off of a single set of flash equipment. Basically how that will work is when you change the power settings, it will update the settings to the flash. But as long as you don't change those settings again, it will only send fire signals after that. Now, if we instead change it to the multiple person, every time we hit the fire button, it's going to send the information of the power level as well as the fire signal, which means if multiple photographers were trying to fire the same flash equipment, then the information would keep up and these flashes would change their output with every click that each photographer takes. But it's more demanding on the battery, so unless you are really using with multiple photographers, don't use this setting. Lastly, there is the app setting, and that basically turns this into a dummy trigger. Once you have the app setting enabled, only the mobile app can change the power of the flash. Otherwise, this is just sending out a fire signal. Next up, we have the distance function. We have one to 100 meters or zero to... I'm actually a little surprised that I didn't have any issues with this receiving the power signals from the transmitter because normally when it is this close, it does not work that stably. And that's exactly what this function is for. If your flash equipment is extremely close, then you can go to the zero to 30 meters. Then it doesn't have quite the distance capabilities, but it'll work better in close proximity. For most purposes, I keep it on the one to 100. Next up, up, we have the step function. The step function allows you to change the power levels that you control. So right here we have 1 1 28th as the minimum power setting with 0.3 stop intervals. But some lights have a minimum power setting of 1 2 56. So this allows you access to that. Additionally, some lights have 10th stop control. So you can control them by 0.1 stop at a time instead of 0.3 stops at a time and you also have a 1 2 56 minimum power setting with 10th stop control. Now, in addition to the fractions, there is also integer control. This is not going to work with this light because this light uses the fractions. However, there are some studio strobes that instead use an integer scale to modify their power. On page four, we have a group option where we can choose between displaying three groups or five groups. So we have A through E, which is five groups by standard. But if you want to simplify it a little bit and you only use three lights, you can just use three groups. Now the standby option is how long until this falls asleep. If it doesn't sense any activity, I just have mine off right now because I'm giving a tutorial, but you can set it to 60 seconds, 30 minutes, 60 minutes or off. The light controls the display light on the back here. We can choose 12 seconds, off or on. On will always be on, off will always be off, and 12 seconds will be on for 12 seconds, and then once you stop interacting with it for 12 seconds, it will automatically power off. LCD is the amount of contrast on the display. You can 
control it anywhere from negative three to plus three. And the final option is for modifying that AF assist lamp that we went over. Whether you're using a mirrorless camera or a DSLR, just make sure that's set properly if you're trying to use your AF assist lamp. And that's it for the operational guide of the Godox X2T. If the video helped you out, leave it a like. On my channel, I have guides to every light that this is compatible with if you need to brush up on interfacing with those lights instead. Subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more videos on flash equipment. Comment below if you have any questions and until next time, keep on shooting.